listeners, today I'm speaking to Sarah Lang, Project Director of Infrastructure New Zealand. Now, infrastructure is vital to any nation because it enables the economy to flourish. And the infrastructure industry keeps New Zealand running through water, power and roads. And it's really a booming sector, forecast to require over 40,000 more people in the next five years. It's also been reported there's an increase in women joining the sector through complementary and related disciplines such as law, planning, architecture and project management. So I'm really keen to find out more about this sector and about the work that's going on to really transform it. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Sue. It's a pleasure to join you and your listeners today. Now, I know that you are the founder of the Women's Infrastructure Network. So tell us about what prompted you to launch that network back in 2016. Well, look, thank you very much, Sue. Infrastructure New Zealand is the thought leadership network or peak body or association for the infrastructure sector in New Zealand. And every year we lead an international delegation going to look at different countries and learn from them about how they plan, fund and deliver infrastructure. In 2015, we took a delegation of Canada. And while we were in Canada, we met with a raft of different infrastructure leaders, CEOs, both public and private. And we also attended a large infrastructure conference in Toronto. And I looked around the room and thought to me, goodness, this looked very different to the infrastructure sector in New Zealand, which is very male. Anyway, I got talking with some of the delegates at the conference and particularly some of the women delegates. And I thought their room looked about 30% women, which was quite different to the New Zealand scenario. I got chatting with them and they said, well, Sarah, why don't you come and join us at the Win Breakfast? And I said, what's the Win Breakfast? And they said, oh, the Women's Infrastructure Network. It's a global network. Don't you have one in New Zealand? And I said, no, I've never heard of it. I went along to the breakfast and it was a lovely gathering of women from right across the infrastructure sector in Canada, from public sector, private sector agencies, banking, construction, finance, engineering, the whole gambit. And I thought, wow, what a great concept. So I came back to New Zealand and I tested the concept with a number of people down here and they thought it was a great idea. So the first thing we did was hold a virtual lunch, both in Auckland and Wellington. So we held real lunches in Auckland, Wellington. And then we hosted a virtual lunch with the Canadian Wynn ladies in Vancouver, Calgary and Toronto and talked about how they'd set up their Wynn network and their various chapters. So here we are, fast forward three years later, we now have seven chapters in New Zealand and 2,000 members nationwide. We launched the Wynn network at Building Nations, which is New Zealand's largest infrastructure conference and it has grown like topsy since then. The three aims of the network are to increase the visibility of women working in the infrastructure sector, to increase the number of women leaders in the sector and to support those women who are there. So it's been an incredibly successful network. I think timing was right. A lot of things aligned in New Zealand at the time with a new woman prime minister the Me Too campaign, and certainly really looking at diversity and inclusion and how infrastructure needs to be an industry of choice and how we make sure it's attractive to everybody and open to to people from different persuasions, different genders, different ethnicities. So it's been an amazing journey. It's been very well supported by the industry and it's starting to create long-term change the sector, I think. Well, it's interesting that you say that, Sarah, and it's fantastic you've had such a success with the network so far, because I was reading that there was recently a survey by Infrastructure New Zealand, which was highlighting a couple of issues that are really important to the success of the sector, such as partnership and collaboration, particularly between the local government, central government, private providers, and so on. And the top performers, in particularly in the procurement sector, are more outcome focused and they treat suppliers and contractors as partners. I'm wondering in terms with perhaps an increase in women coming into the sector and the support that you're providing through the network, do you think that has any relevance or link to the kind of change that's required within the ecosystem of infrastructure? Do you know what, Sue? I really think it does. 
typically women have been sort of under the radar in the infrastructure sector, but we forget there's often a lot of women involved in comms roles, uh, in stakeholder engagement roles, in the sort of soft skill space. And I think what's happening through the network is we're giving visibility to those women. And I think those traits of listening, of partnering and collaboration are now seen as viable skills and necessary skills. So for example, case in point, at the moment in New Zealand, we're currently building a subway in the Auckland CBD. It's an engineering feat, but it's certainly not the most challenging of all underground railway systems in the world. But certainly it is through a busy CBD. Now we can keep employing the same type of people, or we can make sure we employ people with different skill sets to make sure we are looking at the project in a holistic way. So for example, if we were just to employ technical engineers who were boffins and great at their job, but didn't have an outward facing capability, it would be really hard to get stakeholder buy-in to build a railway through the center of your main city. So we really need a diversity of skill set. I really feel quite strongly that we need to employ really diversely to make sure that we are considering the problem from all angles. And I really think that certainly not entirely due to the WIN network, but I do think it's put the issue of um, diversity of thought fairly and squarely onto the radar. It's great to see that it's having that impact in a positive sense. And in, in terms of the women that come along to your network events, what do they gain from being there? Sure. We're open to everybody, um, not just women, men as well, particularly champions uh, of women. And for women to succeed, we do need champions, advocates. We're open to new grads right through to senior CEOs. So everybody along the continuum. For some of those senior people, it's around visibility. It's around sharing their journey, around tips and success stories. For the new grads and interns, it's around role models. It's around creating networks. It's around sharing problems and solutions. It's also around looking at future avenues for job opportunities, and it's around increasing your knowledge of the wider infrastructure landscape. So we get people coming to a range of different events that we run. So we run site visits, we run thought leadership events, we run casual networking events. I think one of our chapters in Queenstown ran a skiing event early one morning, Um, you name it. We have had a raft of different things. And if it's building your confidence in who you are, if it's building your network to discuss and find solutions for any problems you might have, it's an open and friendly environment where you can just be yourself. A lot happening by the sounds of it. Yeah, look, it's fantastic. We've got actually coming up a tour of the Clyde Dam, which is one of the largest dams in the South Island coming up. We've had the Prime Minister speak at our one of our breakfasts. You name it, we've got things happening all around the country. As the network continues to flourish into the future, Sarah, I'm wondering, do you see... Obviously, you're saying that you, you know, men are welcome to attend the, the events and so on. Do you see that ideally the future is an integrated leaders network, regardless of gender, and it's about people, male and female, of all backgrounds, coming together to learn? Or do you think there's still a place for women individually to have something that just more focused on their needs? It's a very good question, Sue. It's something we think about really frequently. So parallel to our WIN network, our Women's Infrastructure Network, is our ET, Emerging Talent Young Leaders Network, for young leaders under the age of 35. So not are we only looking at diversity by gender, we are looking at diversity by age. And we also need to look at diversity by geography, by ethnic group, by religion you name it. So our ET network has been established to really provide opportunities for young leaders to network, to help them understand more about the breadth of the infrastructure industry, to give them access to industry leaders, to profile and also increase their visibility, and to provide some sort of soft skills, public speaking, getting their LinkedIn page up to speed, 
how to network, all of those things that you use in your everyday life. And we've set up two chapters. We've got chapters currently in Auckland and Wellington, and we are launching our third chapter in Christchurch. I guess one of the things that younger people these days, they do like to be led and managed very often differently to perhaps more traditional approaches. I'm wondering, what do you think can help the infrastructure industry be appealing to them and to meet their needs? Well, it's really interesting, Sue. Since we have established this Young Leaders Network, our Emerging Talent Network, I have become very enthusiastic and positive about the future of New Zealand. These young people are savvy. They are sassy. They are well-informed. They have a very strong social conscience. They are far more connected and ethically minded than I ever was at their age. They are pushing the industry to look at sustainability, to look at decarbonisation, to make sure that diversity and inclusion are just the norm, to improve our focus on health and safety. So I think they are the moral conscience of the industry. I think they are going to move the industry to a new place, um, which is great. Um, In some ways, they're the whistleblower, and I'm really keen to seek their opinions. They have some great ideas. They're very connected through technology, and I think they are a wonderful addition to the industry, and that's why we're really supportive. How do you get those people that are in the leadership positions that maybe have been there a number of years, maybe male, how do you convince them that the input and the insights that women and the young leaders can bring to the industry? How do you get them to change? Look, it's not a fast journey. And sometimes you take several steps back before you take steps forward. But I think there is some general cultural change happening in the industry. Um, Five years ago, we, Infrastructure New Zealand as an organisation, were not even looking at the makeup of our speaker panels. Today, there is no way we would proceed with an event unless there's diversity of speakers, whether it be gender, ethnic makeup, age, whatever, on the panel. We just would not proceed unless we are thinking about that sort of thing. And it's just the same. Like We're very careful at our conference. We have no single-use throwaway plastic bottles. We have no straws. We measure our waste. We recycle where we can. You know, five years ago, we probably weren't thinking as much about that as we needed to. I think some of these things are changing. Some of the old guard is moving on. Some of those skeptics that perhaps didn't appreciate some of these values are coming to the end of their careers. I also think, you know, those open to change, embracing these ideas, and they're learning in a two-way stream from some of our young people. So, you know, you can go both ways with mentoring, and I think sometimes mentoring up and mentoring down, particularly in the technology space, is something that some of our older generation would do well to do. Some other ideas, some of our boards have either shadow board members or observing board members. And many of those are often young people who are just starting out on their governance career. Having their voice at the table is very important. And, you know, a gradual um, observing role can be a great entree for some of these young people uh, into board places in the future. It seems like you're really integrating some of the philosophies about valuing difference and the environment and the economy and so on into everyday activities and making it the norm. Look, I think it's a little bit like sustainability, perhaps in the 1980s. You used to recycle your paper and you'd tick the box and think you'd done it. But actually, you need to look at what light bulbs you're using. You need to look at how you're traveling. You need to look at to see if you can reduce your air miles. You need to have a recycle bin. You need to maybe be doing some community contribution. You need to be doing it all the time. It's not a one-tick wonder. It's a long, slow game. I think for some people who are open to change, they're not threatened by employing them more diversely. For others who perhaps come from a position of power and they've never experienced what it's like to be on the margins, it's possibly threatening. But I actually think... New Zealand and the world is a better place where we include the thoughts and views from everybody. Well, you certainly have a role model in the Prime Minister in your country being a woman. Yeah, we do. She's doing a great job. 
she's faced some significant challenges while she's been in power, but I think how she responded to the March uh, Christchurch tragic shootings last year with the Muslim community was exemplary. She's been a great model around um, displaying kindness and respect. And I think going back to some of those values is very important, particularly when we look at some other politicians around the world. Well, it moves us nicely on to the subject of leadership. And I understand, Sarah, from your perspective, you participated in the International Visitor Leadership Programme to the US this year, and you were only one of eight from the Southern Hemisphere who were invited to join that programme. As you continue to develop your leadership journey, tell us about what you learned on that programme. So it was an absolute privilege to be selected, and it, it certainly came out um, a bolt out of the blue for me. So I was selected by the New Zealand American Embassy to attend a three-week leadership program on disaster and emergency management in America. I was particularly interested in uh, infrastructure resilience during times of disaster. Um, it's a big issue for us in New Zealand, particularly with our recent earthquakes. And so I was selected to go up to Washington and visit Washington, Houston, LA and Seattle, learning about obviously the American political system and how they respond to disasters and how they fund and manage and govern disaster response. And then we headed to Houston to learn about Hurricane Harvey and how America responded to that. We then went to LA to learn about mass shootings. And prior to the Christchurch disaster, I thought that would be irrelevant for me in New Zealand. But as it turned out, it was very pertinent. And then we headed north to Seattle to learn about tsunamis and earthquakes, also very relevant to New Zealand. I was really fortunate to attend this leadership program with a number of others from the South Pacific, colleagues from Fiji, Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Malaysia joined me on this leadership trip and it was fantastic because we had a sort of two-way synthesis learning. We obviously learned about the American system and what we learned there was that the private sector and the philanthropic sectors have a very large role to play in disaster management and relief in America, certainly considerably more so in, than in New Zealand and many of the Commonwealth countries who were on the program with me, where in those countries, the government steps in and really takes a civil defence approach. What I also learned is how these other countries manage disasters and some of their responses and technology that they're using. So it was a great opportunity to share success stories and share different systems and also together to analyse and understand how the American system, um, parts of it may be really beneficial to us. From a leadership perspective, for me to be selected from New Zealand to take part in this was both a surprise and an honour. But I suppose also it was a really valid message that one person can make a difference and who would have thought that the WIN Network or the Emerging Talent Network or some of the other things I've done over the years would have ended up where they have. Perhaps timing was right for some of these initiatives. People have come on board and supported me. I have a fantastic WIN advisory board and a number of voluntary chairs around the country who've contributed to that success. So it certainly hasn't happened alone. But I also think everybody thinks maybe they're insignificant or they can't make a difference, but I think everybody can make a difference. And you have to look back and see where you've come from. This was a small idea that happened over a lunch, which has turned into 2,000 people, seven chapters, a nomination for New Zealander of the Year and a winning of several other awards. So, you know, who would have thought? Well, it certainly sounds like you've been making an impact and continuing on with your learning in that leadership program. My final question to you, Sarah, is what does the future hold for you and the industry, the infrastructure industry and its ecosystem? Where do you see it all heading? That's a great question. I actually, and it comes back to my earlier comments around the Emerging Talent Network, I feel very positive. I'm very emboldened and excited about our younger generation coming through. I feel very positive about where they're going to take the industry. 
Um, so I have no fears there. Um, for me, I'm very staunch about only working in areas where I can make a difference and leaving a positive legacy. And so I think the infrastructure sector is a great way to do that. Infrastructure is not just concrete and bridges. Actually, infrastructure is built to improve the well-being of our people. And I'm very passionate about that. I'm very passionate about making sure everybody can be part of that journey. So how we engage with our marginalized communities is a big focus for me. I think we've got a long way to go. I think some of the work that Infrastructure New Zealand is doing is making a positive difference, particularly in our policy and advocacy space. But I also think our leadership has made it a more inclusive industry for many more people. So to get to the bigger vision of improving the well-being in society, is a step on that route is about improving the quality of the leadership within the sector. I absolutely think it is. And I think this government is very much about well-being. I think for us to ensure that infrastructure is delivering the right things and not just random projects for the sake of them, we need to ask why we are building infrastructure and what outcome we're seeking. Is this the best way we can achieve that? I think we're asking those questions in a better way now. I think from some of our international delegations, learning about what other countries are doing, bringing some of those ideas back and tweaking them for the New Zealand environment is also a way that Infrastructure New Zealand can contribute to the wider debate in this space. Well, it's been a great pleasure speaking to you today, Sarah, and I wish you all every success in the future with the network and the work that you're doing. Oh, so thank you very much for your time. I, I appreciate the invitation to talk with you. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Sarah Lang about how the infrastructure sector in New Zealand is changing to better represent the community it serves. Sarah's experience reminded me of the Dalai Lama quote, if you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. I wonder what it caused you to reflect on. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using and tell your friends about us so we can continue to reach more listeners. That's all for me this week, Sue Stockdale. Next week, I will be speaking to Virginia Goathouse about the work her organisation RUN is doing to support refugees in Hong Kong. I hope you will join us then. Mm-hmm.